invite you to just, uh, just let's talk with our Father once again. Gracious Father, tonight, as we're going to open up your love letter to us and allow you to speak to us, help us to understand, Father, that you have a set of values, a moral code, that's to guide and direct our lives. And so as we listen to your words this evening, may you touch us and shape us and mold us into the expressed image of your son, Jesus, because we want to see Jesus. So tonight, we surrender to you fresh in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Tonight, I'm going to be doing both presentations. Uh, Pastor Jim had a meeting down in Alabama that he had to get to. He's got to be there very early in the morning, about 7 o'clock. So, you know, we kind of tried to do this together, and sometimes I had to be away last week. And, uh, so he's going to be away this evening uh, as well, and I uh, will not be back tomorrow evening, but we're going to press on, okay? Amen. Is it okay if I, if I deliver two messages to you this evening? Amen. You won't get tired of me? No. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so tonight, let's talk about the crumbling moral values that we face in society today. It just seems, you know, like years ago, it seems like our homes were a place of security, weren't they? Wherever you went to somebody's home, it was just a, a wonderful place to be. It was like a refuge. It was a sweet place that you could just sort of escape the, 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 the ravaged things that went on in society. But down through the ages, our homes really have been little havens for us. And that's good news. The home where we could flee trials and troubles and the difficulties of life. Unfortunately, in the 21st century, many homes are like a battlefield. They're not those places of refuge and security anymore. Words like abuse and conflict and hostility and anger are commonplace when describing our homes today. So the question comes, what's happening to society? What's going on with the society that we're living in? Sometimes, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you, you know, you sort of had this little thing. If you crossed your fingers, it was okay to what? It was okay to tell a, a little lie. Yeah. Is it okay to tell a little lie? No. I don't think it's okay. Why is there an escalating amount of violence in society today? Why is there an escalating amount of immorality and greed in our society today? It seems like it's just being prolifically, uh, prolific and it's, and it's running rampant through society. What's behind the collapse of the moral values that we're experiencing today. Without a moral compass, my friends, we are thrown into a state of confusion. We might call it social chaos, and we're seeing that today at a high level. Distortion of our values can occur, and they can occur right in our own homes with what we watch and what we see. Times today, they're changing very rapidly. You know that, don't you? And they're not only rapidly changing, but they are dramatically changing. With what we see, there is concern today in the 21st century that we're living in today. The question comes tonight, is there a North Star that can guide us? Who shapes our moral values today? Where are we headed in our world today? Is there anything left that we can literally hang on to? Because sometimes you need to hold on, don't you? Things get bad and the winds blow in our direction and that direction. And you just need to reach out and get a grip because you've got to hang on. It seems like all the standards that we once held on to, even 10, 20, 30 years ago, they're just crumbling under our feet. What's going on today? Is morality a matter of personal definition? Is there anything secure in society today? Are there any moral absolutes? Does God have something to say to us when it comes to moral absolutes? Something, my friends, seems to be fundamentally wrong with our society. The morals that we held once as rock solid and bedrock are now non-existent in our world. Just look at what you see on the television. And what's acceptable today, that 30 years ago, I mean, they would have been banned from what you see. Just go to the grocery store and what you hear in the aisles as common language would not have been acceptable 30, 40 years ago in our society today. But it's commonplace today. 
I believe the Bible is the only place that we can go, and I believe the Bible gives us some very concrete answers that we need to sort of listen to this morning, because the Bible penetrates the very reason that we are experiencing this exploding rise of crime in our society today. Our society has turned its back on God's moral values, God's moral standard. It has cast them off, my friend. Society says that your own mind is the standard. What you decide for yourself is what is right for you, and only you can decide that. The society that we live in today says there's nobody that can tell me what to do, right? I, it's none of your business what I do. I decide for myself what I do. As a matter of fact, get your nose out of my business. That's what we say today. Society today epitomizes Proverbs, the 28th chapter, and the verse 26, and it says this. He who trusts in his own heart is a what? Is a fool. You see, why is that? It's because our minds can deceive ourselves. We can deceive ourselves into believing something, into doing something, into knowing something, when in reality, it's our own thoughts and our own conclusion. It's our own processing of what we have listened to and assimilation of that that we distilled down to a conclusion and we're not interested in what anyone else has to say you know you can justify almost anything that you do if you only depend on your own thought process but I believe it's time that we sort of get back to putting our thoughts up against something someone something that can tell us where we're right and where, we, where we're wrong what do you say to that you see, in Revelation, we can find out some clear-cut answers to what God is trying to tell us. The last book of the Bible, this book of Revelation, it has something very special to tell us, my friends. It's a special message to the last generation that's living just before Jesus comes back. And this book calls us back to morality. It calls us back to the standards of God. It is a final message for all of humanity. Revelation 14, 6, it says... Then I saw another angel. These are these three angels. It's the first of these three angels that I mentioned to you last night. Revelation 14, 6, and it says, Then I saw another angel. What's he doing? It's flying in the midst of heaven, and it have, it's having the everlasting gospel. And what's he doing with that gospel? He's preaching that gospel to everyone that is upon the earth. To all those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, to every tribe, to every people, to every single person that is upon this earth. And then it says in verse 7, fear God and give glory to Him. Jim talked about this the other night. For the hour of His judgment is what? It has come, my friends. You see, fear God. Sometimes, you know, there have been people that I've been afraid of in my life and it's not been, a, and this is not the afraid that God is talking about here. This fear of God here is not saying that we need to be afraid of God. It means that what he's trying to tell us is we need to look at God as an awesome God. We need to look at God with respect. We need to look at God with reverence. We need to look at God and obey what God says. Fear Him means that I am willing to follow Him because I can trust this God because He's the God that's worthy of our worship and our praise and our adoration and all that we can give Him. See, he's calling us back. It's a call to worship God in everything that we do in all of our lifestyle. It's a call to surrender all of my lifestyle to this God. Because it goes on to say this. Why can I do that? Why can I trust that? Why does he want me to do that? Because he tells us. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. God calls us to do all of those things because he is our creator God. Fear God, honor him, love him, respect him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Why? Because he is our creator God. And he is only one that is worthy of our praise and adoration and love. Does that make sense tonight? Amen. Did you see the past, the, this passage of Revelation? It really answers the question of moral responsibility. God is saying to us, I'm going to tell you why there's so much moral decay in society today. I'm going to tell you why there's so much violence that's rampant in society today. 
Why there is so much immorality in society today? Why the lawlessness seems to be rampant in our land, uh, in our land today? And it revolves around this one thing, my friend. It, evol it, it revolves around moral responsibility. The judgment that Jim taught us about calls us to something. It calls us to accountability for our actions. Does that make sense? Yeah. You see, judgment implies responsibility for moral choices that we make in this world. Because if I'm not responsible for what I do, how can God's judgment hold me accountable for those actions? Does that make sense to you this evening? You see, the society that we live in today, it's a society that largely says, I'm not responsible for my actions. It's okay, it says. It declares, this society we live in declares that, that right and wrong is something that every single person determines in their own minds. I mentioned it before, that there are no moral absolutes. But you don't find that in God's Word, my friend, not at all. Society today says, I am my own person. I'm the only one that I'm responsible to. I'm not responsible to you, nor am I responsible to a higher God. When you take the position that you're not responsible to anyone or anything, especially to God, then the next conclusion to that is that there is no judgment because I'm not accountable to anyone or anything. There are no moral standards to guide your life. But I believe God's Word speaks something totally different to us. Friends. Directly from God's Word, we're going to see tonight that judgment implies something. Judgment implies responsibility and moral choices that we make on a continual basis. The question is, does God have a standard of morality and a basis, a foundation for His judgment? Does He? I believe this. I believe that God's law is the basis of morality and the standard of God's judgment. God's moral Ten Commandments. You see, the book of Revelation speaks to a society that says, my mind is the highest judgment. There is no, there is no higher standard. I'll make my own choices. I want to set my own values. But the book of Revelation says, wait just a minute. You are responsible for the choices and the actions that you take in your life. For the hour of his judgment has come. Not, my friends, it is not our judgment. It is the judgment of God. Our judgment is subject to His judgment. Our wisdom. He says, my wisdom is way beyond your wisdom. If you lack wisdom, God says, if any man lack wisdom, what are we to do? We're to ask God for that. You see, why? Because His ways are beyond our ways. His ways confound those who think that they have the mental capacity outthink other people and outthink God. God's ways confound those individuals. Revelation calls us and it calls us back to the law of God which is God's moral standard. The Apostle James, Jesus' brother, puts it this way in James, the second chapter in verse 12. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by what? By what? Come on, it's on the screen. Read it out loud to me. What law is it going to be? It's going to be the law of liberty. The law of liberty is God's Ten Commandment law. Here's some examples. Revelation 11, 19. It says this, that the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in His temple. What's in the Ark of the Covenant, my friend? Inside the sanctuary, as Jim pointed out, that God instructed Moses to build on this earth, in, inside that, that wall, there was a little tent that was called the tabernacle. The sacrifices took place, and inside that tent was divided into two compartments, the holy and the most holy. And the Ark of the Covenant was placed inside the most holy place, and inside the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments that God had written with His own finger. It is placed in that place because it is the standard of judgment. It is the basis of morality. It is the foundation of God's government. It tells us, it reveals to us the very character and nature of God. The ark contains 
God's law. And that's where, that's where the sins of the people were speaking before because that's the law, that's the basis that they were being judged upon. So God's law is the very foundation of God's throne. You see, echoing from the book of Revelation, there's this, there's this voice that keeps coming out. And it's a voice that says, I want you to keep my law. I want you to keep my covenant. Judgment and law are all part of the gospel. They are not contrary. They are not against each other at all, my friends. But somebody says, well, Glenn, I thought we were saved by grace. And we don't need to keep God's law. Let's find out if we find that in Scripture tonight. Is that fair enough? Because what I said is, if I teach anything that's contrary to Scripture, you come to me after the meeting and say, Pastor, I want you to talk to you about that, and here's what I believe. I'll be happy to sit down and talk with you. That's not a problem. But I don't believe you'll find anything that I teach on these screens that's going to be contrary to Scripture because I've not had people come to me and share those things with me. But some people will say we don't need to keep God's law. Some people say when Christ was crucified on the cross of Calvary, He was judged as a sinner dying to pardon our sins. And at that cross of Calvary, all the law was nailed to the cross. The Bible doesn't say that. What the Bible says was nailed to the cross were the handwriting of ordinances that Moses wrote, took down as God instructed Moses what to write. But His Ten Commandments are a very different set of laws, my friends, written by an entirely different person that we're going to discover tonight. So, judgment is actually part of the gospel. That's what happened when Jesus died on the cross. You see, if God could have changed His law, do you think that He would have to have had His Son die on that cross? The Bible says that the wages of sin is what? It is death. There's no way to escape that. And that death had to die. And Jesus died that death for you and for me because we can't pay that penalty. It is death, my friends. And so why would a God send His Son to suffer a cruel death if all He had to do was change His law by some stroke of a pen or some word that He could speak? The law and judgment are all part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The law is what Lucifer broke in heaven. 1 John 3, 4 says this, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and lawlessness and sin, and lawlessness and sin is what? Sin is lawlessness. You see, I may not think it's a sin to steal something, but sin is lawlessness. I may not think it's, it's wrong. I might think in my own mind, you know, it's okay to do some things that the Bible might teach is wrong. But listen to what the Bible's definition of sin really is. Sin is breaking God's law. You might say to yourself, hey, listen, I'm not satisfied in my marriage, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to spend a weekend with my secretary. And that's okay because we're two consenting adults. But guess what? The Bible says, thou shalt not commit what? Adultery. God's law and His eternal moral standard was devised, what defines sin and establishes our own accountability to God. His law defines what morality is, even if our minds don't do that, my friends. The Bible says that sin is breaking God's law. God's law is the pathway to freedom and genuine happiness. God doesn't make rules to keep us from good things. He makes rules to keep and protect us and to allow us to live a life of freedom. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. It protects us. God's laws protect us from a law and a life that would literally destroy us if we live that lifestyle. He says, my law will seal you from that lifestyle. Don't live that lifestyle. It's not healthy for you. Not only is it not healthy for you, it's not healthy for all of the people that you associate with. Some Christians say, you know, I go to a church and I'm happy with my church. We don't preach the law in my church. All we do is preach about His love. 
as if those two things are different. What? I want to tell you tonight what love does. Love always leads to what? Love always leads to obedience. Love will never lead you to disobedience. If you love your spouse, that love for that spouse will not lead you to be unfaithful to that spouse. That love will lead you to obey your spouse. And when she says, pick up your dirty socks and put them in the hamper, love says, I'm going to pick my dirty socks up. Does that make sense? Why? Because I love her. And I want to obey her. And I want to please her. And I want to make her happy. Now she's smiling right now. So. <laughs> love never leads to disobedience. You see, it leads you to keep God's commandments because that's what God's asked us to do. John 14, verse 15 says this. If you love me, what does he say? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. It doesn't seem like he doesn't say at all there that if you love me, you don't have to keep my commandments. He says, if you love me, I want you to keep my commandments. You see, love's response is to obey. Love's response to God is to keep what God asks us to do. And Jesus' own word says, if you love me, I want you to keep the commandments that I have given to you. It's the response of our love for Him out of the great love that He has shown to us. We love God. We didn't love Him first. The Bible says we love Him because He first loved what? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the who? Ungodly, my friend. That was us. He gave His life that we might fall in love with Him. I obey God, not because I, I'm trying to be saved. I want to be obedient to God because I am saved. Amen. And I want my life to demonstrate to others that I'm in this saving relationship with my Savior Jesus Christ. It's the walk that He wants us to live in. Why? Because He wants to reveal to the world who doesn't know Him what people that live like Him will be like. He wants to reveal His character to a fallen humanity. And the character of God is revealed in His Ten Commandment Law. Obedience does not earn me salvation. Obedience merely says and demonstrates that I am in a salvific relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And I trust in Him for everything that He wrought on that cross for my salvation. I don't contribute one little tiny thing towards my salvation. I merely receive it from Jesus Christ. But when I come to the cross, my life of obedience is a demonstration that I am living in a safe relationship with Christ. First John, the second chapter, verses 3 and 4, puts it like this. Now by this we know Him. If we do what? Help me now. If we keep His commandments. John says, there is an evidence. There is a way that we are going to know. Here's the evidence that we are born again believers of Jesus Christ. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is what? Is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. I don't want to be a liar. What about you tonight? Amen. I want to say I know Jesus and I keep the commandments of God and I have the faith in Christ. You see, when we are committed to Christ, when we genuinely know Christ, when our hearts are surrendered to Him, it's a natural response to obey Him, not to find some reason not to obey Him. Anyone who says that God's law is done away with, my friends, forget about those commandments. I want you to run from them because they're only teaching you half the gospel of Jesus Christ. Grace and law are not contradictory ideas. When you are saved by grace, you are not saved to disobey. You are saved to obey. Why? Because when you are saved by grace, the Holy Spirit comes and fills your life. And the Holy Spirit does what? The Holy Spirit fills you and empowers you to live a life that is not like the old life again. Amen. It is a new life, a new creation. Born again by the blood of Jesus. Living a life, a life of victory. The Bible says that him that overcometh will have right to the tree of life. I want to be in that crowd. What about you? So the question comes tonight. What is the role of God's law in our life? 
first of all, let's make it perfectly clear. I, I've said it before, but I want to say it again tonight. And I want to, I've said it this evening, but I want to repeat it again. Because I don't want there to be any mistakes, my friends. Salvation is by grace. And grace alone. Anybody can say amen if you choose to. Amen. You ought to make a Lutheran shout. <laughs> Salvation is by grace and grace alone. The Old Testament believers and all that they did with all of those sacrifices, they looked forward to the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus. And we as New Testament believers, guess what we do? We look back to the sacrifice of Jesus. But we all, Old Testament believers and New Testament believers, we converge at the cross of Christ. And we are saved by grace and grace alone. They're saved by Christ who, who was to come. We are saved by Christ who has come. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You see, but if it's all by grace, then what's the role of God's law in our life? Is that a fair question? Romans 3.20 says this, For by the law is what? Is the knowledge of sin. So if you do away with the law, the Bible says that there is no sin if you do away with the law. You see, it is through the law that God reveals sin to us. Romans 7, 7 says, I would have not known sin except by what? No. Except through the law. And so what's the role of grace in my life? Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved. You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a what? Yeah. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So grace is God's mercy. Grace is God's pardon. Grace is God's forgiveness. Grace is God's power to save us and deliver us from a life of sin and death. That's what grace is in our life. Grace is God's love reaching out to sinners by a God that says, I love you so much that I don't want you to miss eternity with me. Amen. I'm going to give my son to make it possible for you to share that. So the question comes, does grace, does it do away with God's law? No. Romans 3.21 answers that. Paul does. He says, do we then make void the law through faith? He says, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. What does it mean to establish? Jesus himself says, don't think that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but I came to do what? I came to fulfill. He came to fulfill the requirements of the law, and that was to live a perfect life. That perfect life that you could not live. He came to fulfill the, the, the consequences of living a broken life, and that is the wages of that sin that you have committed is death. And he came to fulfill and experience that death in your life so that you might be raised in newness of life to walk after Jesus forever and ever and ever. He came to fulfill, my friends. He did not do away with it. Jesus was the living law. That's who he was. He fulfilled every speck, every requirement, every demand of that law. Now watch this. Romans 6.14 says this. For sin shall not have what? Dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but you are under grace. When does sin have dominion over you? It's when you follow your own way rather than God's way. It's when you break the law and then you are bound by the chain of sin in your life because the Bible says that sin is a transgression of, Paul, of, of the law. Watch what Paul says. He says it again. Sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. Yes. Amen. Let me tell you this story. I was... Uh, when I lived in Florida, we had some uh, church administrative departmental meetings and they were in Daytona Beach. And uh, I was going to drive my car, but Arlene told me that her car was running rough. You know, it was kind of skipping a little bit. It, <laughs> and it was a, a Z28, it had a Corvette engine in it. And, you know, she put put it to work at about 40 miles, 45 miles an hour. And she did that every day and drove home, but it never got it never got taken out, so I thought, well, it just needs to be blown out a little bit. So 
On my way to Daytona, I got up to speed and kind of leveled out, and I spent four days there, and I returned on my way home from Daytona. But as I was about to get on I-95, the car began to skip a little bit again. And so I, I got on the on-ramp, but I looked in my rearview mirror, there are no cars, and there are no cars ahead of me, and I just, pow, I just let the car have it. That car shot up to 115 miles an hour. I was shooting down the road. And I said, wow, it's running pretty smooth. And I let off the gas. And as I was coasting, I looked off to my left. And there in the median was a Florida Highway Patrol. <laughs> By this time, his wheels were spinning and the mud was flying. <laughs> and I just let off the gas and I just coasted off to the side of the road. And he, looked, he got up to my car and he had his dark sunglasses on. Smokey Bear hat on. He said, the son, you know how fast you were going. I said, I got a pretty good idea of what you get me at. He said, I got you at 105. I said, well. So he writes me a ticket. So I decided that I, I really, you know, I don't need a 105 ticket. That, that kind of hurts you a little bit, you know. That's not 10 over, 15 over. That's 35 over. That's, that's reckless driving stuff. You know, that's lose your license stuff. And so I decide that I'm going to go to court. So I called the magistrate over in Daytona Beach and I said, uh, I'd like to have a court appearance. So they gave me a court date and I, I drove over to Daytona. And I get to court and the, cur the courtroom was full of people. And they're all going up and, you know, they've all got speeding tickets, 15 over, 18 over. And <laughs> the judge, guilty, 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 you know, pay the, pay the clerk, pay the clerk. And finally he says, uh, Mr. Uh, Glenn Altermatt, come up. And I, and I stood up, and as I stood up, I, he was like this, and he called me, and he looked back down again. <laughs> so so I, I, I walked to the front, and, and I'm in my suit, and I, I'm looking pretty good, you know. And he says, uh, I see you're cited for 105, how do you plead? Can I plead not guilty? <laughs> Can I plead not guilty? I can't do that again. So I said, no contest to your honor with an explanation. He says, tell me your story. So I tell him my story. I said, your honor, it's not my car, it's my wife's car. She put putts around town. I figured it needed blowing out. And where else am I going to do that? And, and when I'm telling them that, now the audience, the other people who are there with tickets in their hand, they begin to chuckle. They're, you know, they think that's a little humorous. But the judge doesn't think it's humorous at all. But the two bailiffs there, they kind of got a little smile on their face. And, but the judge wasn't impressed with that at all. And I said, you know, judge, I said, I drive a town car. That's a Camaro. I'm not even used to driving that car. I was just trying to make it run a little bit smooth. And so when I got back on the highway, I said, I, I showered down that car. And I said, I looked, to, I looked to the left. There was nobody behind me. And I said, surely nobody passed me. The bailiffs are laughing out loud at this point. The people are out there. They're laughing out loud at this point. But the judge is not laughing at all. And I said, Your Honor, I said, I, I have to tell you this. That it's not my habit to speak like that. As a matter of fact, I wasn't going 105. I was going 115. <laughs> now the judge begins to get a little smile on his face. And I said, Your Honor, I throw myself on the mercy of the court. <laughs> Have mercy on me, Your Honor. And he looks at me. And he said, Mr. Alterman, your explanation was admirable. Adjudication of guilt withheld. No fine, no points, no record. I walked out of the court. I tell you, that was grace. That was grace. I don't advocate for you here today. I don't advocate going 115 miles an hour down the highway. If there are any young folks here, please don't tell the story that your preacher was telling how to go speed and get away with it. I'm going to tell you, it probably doesn't work. But that was grace. Grace. God's grace. What does it mean to be under grace? Was I guilty? Go ahead.
Did I deserve to lose my license or a fine and points and go to driving school and all those things? You bet I did. And when I left there, do you think I drove 115 miles an hour going back to Orlando, Florida? No, I did not. I was very obedient to the law. When was I under the condemnation of that law? It's when I was going 115 miles an hour in violation of the law of the land. You see, to be under grace means that I accept Christ's pardon and his forgiveness. And then I am filled with his power to live a life for him. What does Christ do? The Bible tells us that Christ then does something very special for us. The old covenant, oh, law was on tables of stone, but the new covenant is something very different. Hebrews says that he now writes his law in my mind and in my heart. When they're in my mind, I know them, and when my heart, I feel them, and I want to be obedient to what God has asked me to do. Does that make sense tonight, my friends? The Bible's very, very clear on this subject. When Christ comes, and we, when we come to Christ, and we throw ourselves at his feet. Jesus says this to us. He says no matter what you've done in the past, no matter how sinful your life is, there's something I am going to do for you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to allow you to be born again and to have a new start all over again. What the law does for us is the law merely reveals the great need that we have. When I look at the law, it just really tells me I can see who I am. I can see that I don't measure up to that law. And when I come to Christ, I want him to live his life out through me because he lived a victorious life. When I come to the law, I can see the times that I've been impatient. I can see the times when I haven't been as kind as I should be. I can see the times, my friend, when I have violated the way God has wanted me to live. It's what David means when he says this. Psalms 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is what? It is perfect. And what does it do? It converts the soul. That's what the law does. It drives me to understand the great need that I have, and it brings, brings me to a place where I want to experience conversion in my life. It drives me to Jesus. And I can say to Jesus, Oh Jesus, my heart is broken. My heart is crushed because of my sin. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, pardon me. Someone came to Jesus one time and they tried to trick Jesus. It was a lawyer. And they came and asked Jesus. They said, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? <laughs> and Jesus told him, He says, Listen, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. He says, you shall love your neighbor as what? Yes, as yourself. What was Jesus really doing here, my friends? Jesus was summarizing all of the Ten Commandments because Jesus said on these two commandments, hang hey, everything, all the law and all the prophets, he says the entire law can be summarized in one word. Love God and love your fellow men. It's all about love, my friends. Amen. Love to God summarizes the first four, and love to our fellow man summarizes the last six that there is. He was saying if you love fully, you will love God. If you love fully, you will love your fellow man. Love always leads to one thing, and that is obedience, my friends. God's Ten Commandment law was written with, the, with his own finger, not on tables of, uh, 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 of parchment. You see, keeping God's law doesn't put you in bondage. It takes you out of bondage because of law allows you to be free. I was only in bondage when I was on the road speeding. When I drove back from Daytona Beach to Orlando, I was not in bondage. I was free. Set free by grace, my friends. The Ten Commandments are not given to restrict our freedom. No, no, they are given to set us free. 
They were given by God Himself. Listen to how the Ten Commandments are introduced to us. What does it say? I am the Lord your God who did what? Brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. It is the Lord God, the Lord of heaven, who wrote these Ten Commandments, my friends, with His own fingers on tables of stone because they are moral principles that are to stand forever and ever and ever. Can we take a few moments tonight and read these moral principles together? Amen. Let's see if there's just one of these that we don't like and just one of them or five of them that we don't like and we want to throw them away. Let's just see what the Bible says to us. What are His Ten Commandment laws? First of all, God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God's saying, I want to be supreme in your life. I don't want you to have any other gods. Not yourself, not your life, not your money, not your job, not your wife, not your husband, not your children. I don't want you to have anything before me. Because if you love me supremely, guess what? It allows you to love others in a way that you can only love them if you love me supremely. That allows us to worship Him as well. Then He says... Thou shalt not make unto you any graven image. He says, don't come to me through images, not at all. Come to me directly. Then thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Love God enough to respect his name. Does that make sense tonight? Amen. Think of the name of Jesus, the name at which angels bow, the name at which angels cry, holy, holy, holy. That name is being dragged through the streets in vile cursings today. God says, don't do that. Then he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy for in six days. What did the Lord do? <laughs> Thou shalt not do any labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of whom? Of the Lord thy God. He says to us, I want you to worship me. I want you to worship the creator of heaven and earth. Worship Him as the one who made you. Worship Him as the one who can remake you because you have fallen in your life and I have the power to remake you once again. The fourth commandment, my friend, speaks to this generation. The next commandment, the fifth commandment, says what? Honor thy father and thy mother. In an age when children no longer have any respect, hardly, when kids can say to their parents, you can't tell me what to do, when kids today, if they don't like what you do, I heard on the news the other day that a, a, a daddy took the cell phone away from his, his kid and she called the police. I think they arrested him, didn't they? Yeah. For stealing a cell phone. Fortunately, the judge had enough sense to pitch that. It's unbelievable the world we live in today. The fifth commandment is relevant for us. Today, honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. I want a neighbor that believes that commandment. What about you? Amen. I don't want you to be killing folks at a time when there's enough weapons in this world to destroy the earth multiple times over, my friends. At a time when there's abortion on demand and little tiny unborn babies are losing their life, God says, Thou shalt not kill. A time when innocent children get slaughtered in our schools and people strap bombs to themselves and blow themselves up and hundreds die and they take machine guns and they mow them down in music halls. God says, Thou shalt not kill. Life is sacred. Don't take a life. I want my friends to believe that commandment. Don't you, my friends? Amen. Thou shalt not commit adultery. At a time when immorality is rampant, at a time when there is the lack of moral purity, God's law speaks to this generation and as it has never spoken to a generation before. When society turns its back on God's law, when we have open immorality, look what's happened to our society today. We are on our way to total disaster and destruction because we have taken God's law from the forefront of our lives. I believe there is a time, there is a wake-up call for America today is to come back to God's law.
What do you say? Oh, it's not through some legislation. It is not through some congressional act. It is through the preaching and teaching and the living out of God's law in our lives as a witness to those that we come in contact with. Thou shalt not steal. You believe it's still wrong to shoplift today? You may still believe it's wrong to take something that's not yours today, my friends. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Lying is still wrong. Gossiping is still wrong. Dragging someone's good name through the mud is still wrong, my friends. The Ten Commandments of God speak to our generation. And they are relevant for us as we live our lives today. The psalmist puts it like this. The psalmist in 111 and verses 7 and 9 says this, The works of his hands are verity and justice, and all of his precepts are what? They are sure. How long do they last? He says, They stand fast forever and ever. He has commanded his covenant forever, my friends. Satan lost heaven because he disobeyed God. Adam and Eve lost the Garden of Eden and they lost that intimate relationship with God because of disobedience. God is calling the people back to his Ten Commandment law. Hebrews 8 and verse 10 says this. I alluded to it earlier. Watch this now. For this is the covenant. This is the new covenant of the New Testament. This is what's preached and taught, my friends, as a substitute. But notice what it says. The new covenant is this. For this is the covenant with I, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God. And what are they going to be? They shall be my people. I want to live in that covenant. What about you tonight? God says, I'm going to put my, my covenant in your mind and in your heart. I want you to know it. I want you to live it. I want you to love it. I want you to experience it. I want to love God enough to obey Him. Notice how God describes the last day people who are going to be on the earth just prior to Christ's coming. Here's the patience of the whom? Saints. Are you a saint tonight? How many here can say, I'm a saint tonight? Let me see your hands. Those of you who can't say that, come down front after the meeting and we'll have a little chat. And when we're done, we're going to say, I'm a saint. Because it's really easy. Because if you're a child of God, you know what? God says, God says you're a saint. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you have accepted Him and He's washed you and made you new, He calls you a saint. Here are, here is the patience of the saints. Here is the patience of my children, of my people. Here are they that do what? They keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Listen, you can't keep the commandments of God unless you have the faith of Jesus Christ. You can't do it. All the other religions in this world, my friend, are predicated upon one thing, and that is performance. They tell you how to live and eat and walk and talk and to be better people, but they don't solve the sin problem in your life. Christianity is the only religion in the world that solves the sin problem in our lives and the performance problem in our lives. Because the performance that God sees when He sees you and He sees me is the life of Jesus Christ. That's the robe of His righteousness that covers us as He remakes us and shapes us and works us through the issues as we surrender to Him on a daily basis. As He grants to us the victories in our lives. Here they are, the faithful ones, my friends. Those who keep the commandments and have the faith of Christ. Revelation 22, 14 says this, Blessed are those who do what? Do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and that they may enter through the gates into that city. I want to be entering through those gates. What about you, my friends? Amen. Jesus Christ pardons us. He comes, and He says, I'll give you mercy, I'll give you grace, and I'll give you the power to live for me in a world that is absolutely gone and hate life. Christ looks into our eyes and Christ says, I have something special for you. It's this covenant relationship. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to write my commandments. I'm going to 
take them off those tables of stone that are hard and cold. I'm going to write them. I'm going to put them in your mind. I'm going to write them in your mind. I'm going to be here tonight. I want to experience the, the new covenant of Jesus. How many here tonight want to say, Jesus, I want you to write those commandments in my heart. I want you to put them in my mind. Would you pray with me, Heavenly Father, tonight? May your spirit, may your spirit, may your spirit do his work in our lives. Help us, Father. By his presence, help us to know, God, a shadow of a doubt, that you, your great desire is for us to enter into this new covenant relationship with you. Those of you who are here, who want to say, I want that relationship, just slip your hand up. Just slip it up. God bless you. God bless you. Father, you see our hands. By the power of your Spirit, make our relationship with you so real. Make our understanding about your will for our lives so clear. Give us, Father, through the indwelling presence of your Spirit, the ability Surrender and walk with you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.